military member to civilian identity in transition. A very warm welcome to all of you who've joined us for the live activity tonight. And we had over 2,000 registrations for this one, which is a, a very impressive number, and I think a testament to just how important this issue is for clinicians around the country. Welcome also to those of you who are watching us on a recording, and a very warm welcome to our panelists who I will introduce in just a moment. First, I'd like to pay our respects to the traditional custodians of the lands across Australia upon which our panelists and our participants are located. I'd like to pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and future. My name is Mark, Mark Creamer. I'm a clinical psychologist in private practice and also a professor in department of psychiatry at the University of Melbourne. And I've had a very long interest in veteran and military mental health. And as a clinician, I often see uh, people who are about to leave or have just left the military and who are struggling with a whole range of different challenges. And so I'm very pleased to be able to facilitate this panel tonight and to draw on the expertise of our expert panelists. Uh, without further ado, let me introduce them. Uh, you already have copies of their bios, so I'll keep it very, very brief. First, I'd like to introduce Gerard Gill. Gerard is a very experienced general practitioner uh, with a large veteran practice. And until recently, he was a professor in uh, general practice at Deakin University here in Victoria. He's completed an extraordinary 37 years in the Army Reserves and risen to the rank of Colonel. Uh, welcome, Gerard. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Mark. And I saw, I was interested to see that you uh, deployed to Kuwait in 2008. Uh, what was that like? Well, it was uh, quite a challenging experience to find yourself as the equal highest ranking officer among 80 people running a war. Uh, living on an American base in the middle of the desert. Uh, but uh, it had its uh, lighter moments. Uh, one of the more interesting things was that the people that I was looking at, uh, checking medically coming out, had all suffered from what was called Baluchi Belly, where building a ford across the Baluchi Pass, they had all developed gastro. And so that was a good talking point to talk to people as they disappeared from the war zone coming back to Australia. Certainly. Good talking point. Doesn't sound terribly pleasant, but still, good talking point. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thanks for joining us. Um, our next panelist is Russell McCashney. Russell is a social worker joining us tonight from Launceston in Tasmania. He has enormous experience in the assessment and treatment of mental health problems in veteran and military populations. And he worked for 25 years for the VVCS. Uh, now known as Open Arms. It's going to take me ages to remember that new name, but uh, welcome, Russell, and thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Mike. I'm always interested, Russell, to know what people do to get away from the stress of work. So tell us, how do you relax? Well, I work, I work part-time, and my wife and I go down to the Tasman Peninsula. We have a place down there, which is south of Hobart, so we go down and relax, get some fresh air, and I don't work full time, as I said, so we managed to get some extended days down there and time out of the line, I guess, is pretty healthy stuff for us. And we enjoy that and visit our son in Melbourne from time to time. So that's us. So that would be somewhere down near Port Arthur, wouldn't it? Yeah, it's down that way. It's about 10 k's from Port yeah. Arthur where we are. I mean, that's a place that's had its fair share of pretty unpleasant history too, of course. Indeed. Okay, thank you, Russell. Our final uh, panel member tonight is Nicole Sadler. Uh, Nicole is currently Director of Military and High-Risk Organisations at Phoenix Australia Centre for Post-Traumatic Mental Health. She spent 23 years as a psychologist in the Australian Army and is still in the Army Reserve as a, uh, as serving as a colonel also. So welcome, Nicole. Thanks very much for joining us tonight. Thanks, Mark. Um, my understanding is that you were kind of um, predestined for a military career. It was in your stars even before you were born, wasn't it? That's right. I very much come from a military family. My father was a Vietnam veteran uh, and uh, I joined the military when I was 19 as a reservist and then went into the full-time army. Um, and my son is now in the military, uh, so very much the military is part of our family history. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, deeply ingrained. All right, well, thank you, Nicole, and thank you to all our panel.
Can I just quickly run through some tech stuff for everybody? Um, to access the, ch the chat box, click the open chat tab, and that will allow you to make comments or to ask questions as we go through the webinar tonight. Uh, the resources library tab contains things like the slides and the vignette and a whole range of resources, but I recommend you don't look at it now because that will distract you. We will send you a link to those resources immediately after the webinar, and you can check them all out then. Uh, there's also a technical support FAQs uh, if you get stuck. And we would like to hear your feedback at the end when you do the exit survey about how you found this platform uh, for the webinar. But at this point, let me um, introduce the webinar series. So this is the 10th in a series of DVA commissioned webinars on veteran and military mental health. We've done webinars on, um, well, all sorts of things, PTSD and anger and sleep and suicide. Um, and if you missed any of those, they are all available on the DVA at ease website as well as on the MHPN website. So do uh, catch up with those. But tonight, of course, we're looking at the challenges that people face when they're transitioning out of the military and trying to adjust to civilian life. And we're going to do that using a vignette to um, uh, act as a kind of jumping off point. You've all had time to read Garth's story, so we won't go through it in detail. But we are going to use Garth's story, as I say, as a kind of a stimulus to, to, to prompt some of the key issues and challenges that are raised to someone who, who is coming out of the military. Um, so each of our, our panelists will give a brief five-minute talk uh, on their particular perspective of Garth's story or the issues raised by Garth's story. Uh, and then we'll throw it open for a general discussion and pick up some of the questions. And as a result of all that, we hope that by the end of the webinar, um, you'll be able to identify the challenges to self and identity. And I think more broadly, the challenges really that ADF personnel may face when they make this transition out of the Defense Force to civilian life. We hope that you'll better understand effective evidence-based strategic and indeed individual interventions that are going to help people as they transition out and also that are going to maximize their strength. And we hope that as a result of both of those two, you'll feel more confident in assisting veterans and indeed perhaps their families uh, when they make this difficult transition. So without further ado, then, I would like to hand over to our first panelist again, um, uh, hand over to Gerard to talk a little bit about a GP perspective on uh, GARF. So over to you, uh, Gerard. Well, thank you very much again, Mark. Look, GARF is not typical of most veterans uh, who leave the Defence Force. Most veterans are not suffering the complexities uh, that GARF uh, has. There are a number of people who present to you in crisis in general practice. And Garth is perhaps typical of people who present in crisis. And what you are looking at in Garth is that you're looking at somebody who has lost the support structures uh, that lie within the Defence Force. And if you really look at the Defence Force, it's an organisation based very much on teamwork around a sense of belonging. Uh, and people have a very strong investment in belonging to the ADF. They also uh, have a sense of achievement because the ADF gets you to do things that other people don't do. And uh, if you've ever uh, repelled out of a helicopter, that's something that not many other people do. Uh, and uh, to be able to do that without any fear is a considerable achievement in its own way. The other thing about the ADF is that there is recognition. And uh, people in the ADS have often been places that they can't talk about. In the past, uh, we sent our submarines into some very interesting places. And under the Official Secrets Act, no one can actually tell you what they did. Uh, but uh, within the Navy, uh, if you're a submariner of that particular period, people will know where you've been because it's known. And you'd be recognized for that. The other sort of thing is that you develop skills and experience foreign to others. And I was sort of reflecting on this. And one of the things that I learned was that if you move troops in an open truck in cold weather subject to frostbite, every 10 kilometers, you've got to march them a kilometer to stop them getting frostbite. Now, that's not much use in Australia. But 
it's a very handy thing in war and may mean the difference between losing your troops and losing the war. The other thing about the ADF culture is that it's a very structured life. You get up in the morning and someone tells you what to do. Uh, it's financially very secure. There are a whole series of fringe benefits uh, that you become, in, you become aware of. Uh, there's also a very much sort of work to rule regulation and uh, one of the more interesting stories about the Air Force is that basically come 12 o'clock on a Friday, uh, it's very hard to find active personnel on an Air Force base uh, in peacetime. Uh, but there are downsides to uh, the ADF as well and because the ADF just spends a long time away training or uh, on operations or on courses, uh, families are often stressed. They do move around roughly on the three yearly cycles. So people uh, find their children lose their friends, their wives lose the people they know well and that certainly throws quite a bit of stress uh, onto people. Uh, we know that somewhere around about five and a half to six thousand people separate from the ADF each year and most of them have served less than five years. So we've got quite a number of people who join uh, the military uh, and it's just part of the phase of their life. But there are a number of people for whom the ADF is their lifelong career and uh, these people have invested an enormous amount in the ADF. Unfortunately, about a fifth of people leaving the ADF were medically discharged. And the main reasons for this having worked in the part of the ADF uh, where we handle people taking discharge on medical grounds is the problems of mental health uh, and chronic pain. And uh, particularly uh, in the army, uh, because we carry large loads and we do a lot of stuff, we do break a lot of people. And chronic pain certainly uh, has some uh, influence uh, on uh, people's mental status. And those of you who read Veterans Mates uh, will see that we've recently run a condition on veterans, uh, veterans with chronic pain suggesting that psychology is all these veterans with. Now, there's a process for getting out of the ADF and particularly if you've got medical problems, you're supposed to have a handover summary prepared by Garrison Health. The organisation uh, within Defence which is responsible for medical care uh, on base. As well as that, uh, people are entitled if they have suffered injury or damage resulting from service to make a claim against DVA and these claims should have been initiated uh, before people discharge but sometimes people are in a hurry to get out, uh, they really felt unhappy with the military uh, and leave without settling these claims and particularly people that have got significant mental health problems may not uh, really be able to face up to the complexity and the slowness of the DVA claims approval process. Uh, so that's fair. The other sort of thing for general practitioners is that you can claim uh, a health assessment item once for veterans separating from the military which enables you to take a good history and look at things. And for most veterans if they have a mental health problem it's possible to get what's called no liability mental health care which enables you to prescribe uh, at taxpayer expense uh, psychiatric medicines and to get psychology and psychiatric services. Now the main ADF health problems that people have are very similar to the Australian population. The number of people in the ADF uh, who have uh, mental health problems is perhaps slightly less than this in the Australian population because uh, we have less people developing psychosis because we screened them at the time uh, we recruited them. But the major problems are the common problems we see in general practice of anxiety and depression. Now post-traumatic stress disorder occurs but it's not any more prevalent than it is in Australia and the number of people who have post-traumatic stress uh, have this not as a result of military service but because of things that have happened in their lives before they joined defence or as a result of 
of the sorts of things that happen, like witnessing car accidents or vicious brawls and things like that. But one of the problems that has been a problem, and I've certainly encountered this, is that people hide their mental health problems because these impact on your ability to deploy, and certainly for those who are of a warrior class, deploying is what their life is about, uh, and uh, they try and conceal uh, the fact that people are actually suffering from mental health stress. Now, people get particularly concerned about the suicide risk. The suicide risk while serving in the ADF is less than the Australian population, but there does seem to be a problem around separation. And much of this, I think, hangs around the fact that people lose the support base of uh, the people that they've been working with, and they lose the support base uh, of people that understand what they've been through and uh, actually recognise them. And while it's a bit uh, dated now, I can well remember I looked after uh, in a nursing home a veteran who was out of Trebrook, and his next door neighbour was a guy who served in the commandos in the Second World War. And the Ratter Brook died, and the commando, uh, who I thought probably had a harder war than my Ratter Brook fella, said, those rats were something special. Uh, and it was something that I was not aware of at that time. Uh, so th there is this sort of loss of recognition. There's a loss of structure. And there's, as someone said, you've got to make a major adjustment. You've got to buy an entire wardrobe because everything you have been using comes courtesy of the taxpayer out of the queue store or clothing store. So there, there are issues uh, that arise in terms of loss of status, loss of purpose, uh, and particularly for people who are struggling, uh, that is the, the issue. And identifying those people and connecting them with the services, which we're going to be talking about a bit later on, is probably the key for general practitioners. And if you can get people engaged with DVA and get their no liability entitlement, that enables you to access a lot of services on their behalf that they have been Okay. So back to you, Mark, at this stage, and hear what our other panelists have had to say. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed, Gerard. It certainly raised a whole lot of issues there that uh, I'm sure we will be picking up as the night goes on. Uh, Thank you very much for that. Let's move on now and um, hear a bit more of a social work and a perhaps a community perspective on transition and on uh, Garth's story. So I'll hand over to you, Russell, if I could. Thanks, Mark. Um, social work perspective is going to engage with Garth holistically and systemically, obviously engage with him as a client, but dealing systemically around family or his estranged family, uh, veterans affairs, community services, other service providers and so on. So after the GPs provided an initial assessment session to address urgent medical requirements and so on, Garth would need to be engaged with an intensive case management approach, probably through an agency like Open Arms and they're a, a good agency for that because they provide a holistic approach, a continuum of care from individual counselling and therapy, case management, into programs and so on. So a step care approach is required um, to initially to deal with the immediate crisis from a case management framework, stabilise GARF, engage with other service providers as required and, and the family, Karen his ex-partner, Chris her partner and the children, and to look to more specific psychotherapeutic treatment. In more detail, that phase, as I said, was, was dealing with the crisis level, engaging with possibly an ex-service rep to look at any DVA entitlements, and Jared alluded to that a little bit, about non-liability acceptance and so on, but it may be through an RSL rep, it may be through Young Digger's website, has a link to um, advocates and people that can help, and they advise that veterans not do claim stuff by themselves because you can invariably word things wrong and so on. And if you've got the help of the, the advocate, they can do that work for you. Um, there'd be need to be a risk assessment and a risk management plan and safety issues for Garth and certainly for Karen and the family, if depending if any family violence orders or anything because of the assault 
from her partner and ongoing medical support obviously in the background to help with um, moderating alcohol and starting on medication and so on. Case manager or primary therapist will need to develop a therapeutic alliance. Now the primary task of therapy is to engage with clients. This is a crucial part of this man's engagement with services. It's what I call the front end. Um, it's being important to know where he's at and is he ready to change or just does he want the problems to go away? And if you think about those of you who have looked at, most of you probably have, Prochaska and Di Clementi, that model of change, it's very useful to think about where is he? Is he in that pre-contemplative stage or he really knows he's a problem or can he take responsibility for it or is it everyone else? And motivational interviewing is a great intervention there, psychoeducational approach to explain how long-term military, traumatic experience and so on, transitioning out, making a change in identity or a transition from a military approach to a civilian approach. And then also to ensure Karen and his partner has access to open arms because of counselling, because they're ineligible, and perhaps age appropriate engagement for the children. He may be referred to a mental health social worker or a psychologist. Um, this may happen down the track or the social worker that sees him initially may provide that. So, it really depends, but the urgent things at the moment because of this care approach is to engage with him and make sure he's um, dealing with the immediate issues. He's having to start to come to terms with the army's no longer there as a safety net. He'll be confronted with a very real sense of not fitting into the civilian world and the things that worked in the army don't work out here. He's experiencing a loss of identity and sense of self which the army provided and acknowledging this for him and internalising that for his process. There comes a point down the track with people like this that are reasonably typical in this way, that the penny drops and they do start to see that, oh, I need to change the way I relate to people and what I've been doing is counterproductive, the drinking, having trouble with work, losing the temper, the short fuse, etc., isn't working. And also to think about engaging in with the DDA process Often veterans are therapeutically on hold while they're um, dealing with DVA and these practical things. And if you're trying to engage with a lot of mental health type conditions like post-traumatic stress, etc., if that's present, they're often not. It's often harder to engage with that. So it's really better to deal with the practical level, sow the seeds, and to allow him to. Um, deal with the practicalities and once you build trust then he can link into those more psychological type issues. Great. Thank you very much indeed Russell. Again a whole lot of stuff there and a whole lot of stuff we'll come back to I think particularly around some of those services that are available to them. Can I just pick up quickly on, on well something a bit different actually to be honest with you. Um, we, we think about and we're going to talk tonight about transition as a process as it were. Um, and I'm reminded of something that I saw a very long time ago, a v uh, video made by VVCS called You're Not in the Forces Now, which I thought was a wonderful way of introducing people to the fact that there's some stuff they're going to have to let go uh, in order to move on. Is, is that something, would you go along with those kinds of ideas? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's, that's an excellent video. It's now available on YouTube. Nick Fothergill is a veteran who was a counsellor and he, he appears on it. So if, if people out there want to Google, you're not in the forces now on YouTube, you can see it for free and it very much explains that psychological conditioning of the, of the military training and how it's functional in the military context, not functional in the, in the civilian context. Yeah. yeah, I agree, I agree. I thought it was very good and that, that, that point about, yeah, it was very useful then, not useful now. Okay, thanks a lot, Russell. Um, let's move on now and hear from our final panellists uh, to get a psychology and perhaps even a bit of military perspective. Uh, over to you, Nicole. Thanks, Mark. So if I had Garth coming into my office, I'd be trying to do a comprehensive assessment with him. Uh, the key aims of that would be trying to work out what his clinical treatment needs and what uh, sort of 
services he would be amenable to accessing, thinking about what psychosocial services that he requires, um, having a think about what his risk factors are, but also what are his strengths and his protective factors, um, as well as his willingness or readiness to engage in any type of treatment. Um, and you need to be doing this assessment in a military or veteran aware manner. So the sorts of things that you need to be thinking about from a clinical perspective, um, we know from contemporary uh, research that um, military members can have a range of mental conditions, um, not just PTSD, but uh, various other conditions and often they're comorbid. And some of them might be ones that you wouldn't even expect, such as bipolar disorder. So you need to be making sure that you're doing an assessment which looks across the range of different types of conditions. Also think about the impact of the more simple sub-syndromal um, conditions that he might have um, and how they impact upon his functioning as well as his quality of life. Think about his anger, his sleep problems, alcohol misuse and also his increasing social isolation. In terms of his risk assessment, think about risk to self but also to others. Um, we do know that the risk of suicidality and completed suicides do increase following transition from military service. In terms of psychosocial considerations, the, the things that I'd be thinking about would include the vocational issues. We know that in the military he was high functioning, he was a medic, he was a sergeant, but some of those skill sets would not have been easily transferable or translatable to a civilian environment. It looks like he's having problems in terms of assimilating to civilian hierarchies and structures. Um, and this is creating tensions and conflicts for him in the workplace and making it difficult for him to hold down employment. Um, we're seeing this uh, conflict uh, also across other relationships. Have a look at those conflict resolution and communication skills, not only with uh, work colleagues, but also his partner, uh, his ex-partner and his children. Um, think about financial stress. Uh, as we're seeing employment instability, what does that mean for him in terms of other um, parts of his life, including uh, his housing um, and perhaps even escalating legal costs for him. Other social considerations, psychosocial considerations, include his social engagement. Um, we know it's really important that people are able to maintain their social networks and social engagement uh, as part of their mental health and wellbeing. Um, and we do see sometimes as people are transitioning out of the military, they have trouble reconnecting and, and building new social networks. But it's really important that people are able to do this, which are beyond just those military groups, both in terms of work, but also social networks. Um, then also think about his general health and wellbeing. Uh, he talked about weight gain, lack of exercise. What does that mean for his overall health and wellbeing? As part of this assessment, for it to be military aware and veteran aware, you need to be thinking about the fact that people don't just transition into being a military member, they also transition out of being in uniform. And that can be quite a challenging process. And that doesn't matter what type of transition that they've had, whether it be that they've done it um, voluntarily or involuntarily. So some of the things that you might want to be thinking about are service related factors. What was the meaning of his service to him? How has it been tied to his sense of identity? Um, and since he joined the military in his late teens, this has probably been a really important part of his development and how he thinks about himself and his self-worth. How has that changed as he's, tra as he's tra transitioned out of military service? Have a think about trauma exposures which may have occurred um, during his career. Um, these may have occurred during deployments. We know that he did some humanitarian assistance and also went to Afghanistan. But also think about um, trauma exposures that may have happened to him um, in garrison um, or in training. And importantly, also think about those that may have occurred in his personal life. Um, take into consideration what are the skills and strengths that he gained from his military service. He obviously was high functioning. Um, there were mo lots of very positive things about his military service. Um, take an audit of what those skills and strengths were. How can you build on those in terms of therapy and how can you reconnect him to those strengths that he has um, gained across his military time? Then have a think about his transition factors. What, was he, what were his expectations when he transitioned? How prepared was, was he for transition? Um, 
did he just transition because he'd reached his goals or perhaps were there some sub-syndromal issues going on for him which were already impacting his functioning and his ability to cope with military service? Um, as I said, there's transitions in all there's challenges in all different types of transitions of military service. Um, and you need to be asking him what was the meaning uh, and expectations that he had for that transition. How can he think about retaining those more positive uh, links with military service um, and his pride in his military service, but at the same time successfully reintegrating into non-military work and social life? We know that this is a really important component of people successfully transitioning out of full-time military service. Just some basic uh, sort of more general considerations. Um, we do know that there are stigma and barriers to care for serving, but also ex-serving military personnel. So it's not unusual that they'll present for the assistance in the context of lots of life uh, stresses and in the context of a crisis. Um, and sometimes that can mean that they're not particularly ready or motivated to engage in care. And as the other presenters have already talked about, sometimes what you'll need to be looking at is what what can you do in terms of step care before you're getting people into evidence-based or more um, complex therapies? Think about the multidisciplinary services he has or could access, um, including DBA and Open Arms, but also ex-service organisations. Think about a vocational assistant, adjunct therapies, social engagement and also relationship support. Um, and finally, whilst it's really important that we engage him and retain him in evidence-based care for mental conditions, we know that this is the best way of getting outcomes for individuals, we also know that there's lots of benefits in terms of engaging people in adjunct therapies and activities, um, which can help to promote social engagement but also healthy lifestyles. And they can be um, done through ex-service organisations but also other social and community groups. So, Lots of importance in terms of that comprehensive um, psychosocial assessment, looking at not just clinical needs, but also um, his health and wellbeing, psychosocial considerations, and also a step care approach. Thanks, Mark. Great. Thank you very much indeed, Nicole. Again, uh, a whole range of issues there that we will be picking up on later in our discussion. Um, but at this stage, I'd like to, to um, open it up for a broader discussion. Uh, I'd like to encourage our panelists to jump in and ask questions and disagree uh, at any time. Um, I must say that I've been extremely impressed with the number and quality of questions that we've received from you, our participants. And uh, I'd love to go through all of them and answer them individually, but I'm afraid we're, we're not going to have time to do that. But as a start, what we thought we might do is, um, uh, sorry, I'm doing the wrong slide there, never mind. Um, what I thought that we might do is give you a poll. Uh, so on your screen now, you should be able to see a list of four themes that we identified from the questions that you sent in. So we've got um, contributing factors to uh, transitioning challenges. So that's the kind of things that make transitioning easy or bad. Uh, we've got influence of, uh, um, I guess military experiences, let's broaden it out from moral injury to, to, to um, uh, military experiences on the transition. Uh, we've got veteran specific services, so, so what services are available to help them and then how they impact upon the family. So if I can ask Renan now to start the poll please. And you as participants have got 30 seconds now to vote for the one that you think is the most relevant, the most important topic. Um, and I have to be brutally honest and say that I'm not promising that we'll do them necessarily in order. Uh, because sometimes they don't fall in order, but we will make sure that uh, the one that you pick as being the most important, we will certainly make sure we devote plenty of time to. So um, that's right, I can see the votes coming in now, which is really good. You've just got a few more seconds, about 10 more seconds, so click that button if you want to. Um, okay, lovely. And so now I'll ask um, Renan to close the poll and to pull up the results, please. And uh, interestingly, so the one that, that, that I always I see if I can predict what people are going to vote for in this, and I always get it wrong without fail. But anyway, yeah. so the one that, that's come up highest here is the, um, the influence of moral injury. But as I said, I'd like to expand that out about more broadly the influence of military experiences on the process of transitioning. Um, and, and, and we'll certainly get onto that. Um, 
as a way perhaps of um, easing us into that, I, I would like to pick up uh, something that actually Gerard started with, but I'll throw this first to Russell, um, about whether or not uh, Garth was a kind of typical presentation. Do you think that Garth is someone um, is typical of the veterans that we might see? Look, he's, he's typical of a, of a type of veteran we'll see. Um, to quantify it in an overall presentation of veterans is pretty difficult. And I think Jared alluded to the fact that he's, he's typical of that type of presentation. And I know that doesn't quite answer it, but what I mean by that is for someone who has left probably because he, for family reasons, not because he'd really finished his military career, maybe he had things he hadn't quite achieved, but he certainly achieved a lot, as, as Nicole said, he was high functioning. But um, I think the fact that he left for, to be close to his children because his partner and he had separated, um, he was typical in that he may, I'm not sure how he did the transition, but whether he looked at any disabilities he could apply for, where he'd thought about vocational things, which it seems like he may not have because it seemed that he was struggling in the workforce and some jobs he had tried had not succeeded. And one would think if he's a medic and, and a sergeant that he'd had instructing skills, he'd have medical knowledge of some sort, you know, he could work in a hospital maybe, all sorts of things. But that didn't work out because his personality was and his identity was he was still back in the army, and that's I think it's important you said at the beginning, Mark. It's, it's all a process, and it's something that happens over a longish period of time. So, in that sense, I think he's typical of a lot of veterans that things build up, build up, build up, and then something happens to the key that unlocks Pandora's box, and all these problem issues come out at once. And he presents as a very complex case with everything from family violence type issues through to you know, a range of comorbid mental health conditions and possibly some physical health issues. So there's sure. a range of things. Yeah, sure. Um, I wonder if I could pick up on something uh, you said early on there. And I'm going to throw it back to Gerard because you also mentioned it, Gerard, in your talk. Um, it, it looks as though Garth hasn't engaged with any kind of DVA services. We know there's a lot of DVA services available. Um, is it your experience, Gerard, that um, Sometimes perhaps people are reluctant to engage with DVA, that perhaps there's some reason why they don't want to access DVA services? Uh, look, there are complexities of engaging DVA services. And you know, the DVA arose as a means of compensating those damaged in the First World War. And uh, there's been a sort of culture of people who rapidly take up services that they probably are, aren't strictly entitled to compared to a group of people who feel that they uh, are sponging on the taxpayer and, and moving there. Now that's been a conflict in all sort of compensation systems. But also the, the process is incredibly bureaucratic. And uh, if you are stressed, uh, as uh, Russell said, you're better off probably getting an RSL advocate to deal with the bureaucracy you've got to deal with. But luckily for us, if we're dealing with people with mental health problems, the no liability process usually takes less than a week to get someone a white card so that you can start to, get, to link them into the services that they need. Before then, you can certainly link them uh, into uh, open arms, uh, the old veterans and veterans family counselling service. Okay. Uh, so we'll go back and talk about those services in, in uh, response to one of the other themes. But just to clarify what you said there, the non-liability, because I think this is crucial. I, I'm right in saying, aren't I, that um, anyone who served even one day in the Australian Defence Force can automatically get treatment for a mental health condition without needing to prove a service connection. Uh, that would be right? That's correct. Yeah, yeah. So important for people to know, because I've got a feeling that a lot of veterans don't know that, and I suspect perhaps a lot of providers. But okay, thank you very much for that. Let's move on, and let, you know we, we should address this one that the uh, that was the winner of the poll. I'm not trying to avoid it, I promise you. And this is about um, the influence of military service, and, and in this case, perhaps the moral injury on um, transitioning, and how difficult it is to tra transition. Um, and I suppose the point I would make at the outset, and I might bring you in, Nicole, here, is um, I. I guess that we would probably say that a number of experiences during military service 
can affect the development of mental health problems, and that mental health problems can um, make it more difficult for people to, to transition. So Nicole, I'm wondering, um, well, I guess first of all, can I get you to comment on, it's probably not true to say that everybody who has difficulty transitioning has a mental health problem. Would that be right? Yeah, that's correct. So um, we do know that mental health problems can increase as people transition out of full-time military service. That's what the contemporary, um, or research of contemporary veterans is telling us. Um, but we also know that the majority of them are doing well, that they're high functioning, um, but there can be problems in terms of vocational or psychosocial issues. They don't have to just be to do with um, mental disorders. Um, we also know in terms of moral injury, um, look, this is an area that we're doing more, in, more research into, um, but moral injury is when someone has been um, involved in or exposed to things which are against what their values might be um, personally um, and they've, they've found that difficult so they've either been um, subjected to it or witnessed it or they have in fact been the perpetrators of that. Um, and it seems to be that, that if someone feels that there has been a moral injury it can make it it can make it very difficult um, in terms of perhaps responding to some of the normal treatments that we might have for mental disorders. It can make it more complex for them. Um, and we seem to see that sometimes when people are transitioning out of military service, that's when they start to have the time or the space to stop and consider their military service and perhaps some of the things that they've been asked just to do or some of the things that they've uh, witnessed and they start to question those things and wonder how they reconcile those or fit them in with their um, values or their expectations that, as they're integrating into a civilian life. Um, so that can make it difficult for them. Um, they, they start to question themselves and they start to question their values and um, that might be something that uh, uh, can have an impact upon their mental health and their well-being sure, as well sure. as their sense of identity. And they may well, in fact, go through those kinds of questions, that kind of questioning about what they've done without, again, necessarily having a mental health problem. That's just part of the process of trying to work out, make sense yeah, of them. Correct. Yeah, correct. Yes, yeah, as, as they're right. trying to work out what does it mean to now be a civilian versus my identity as a military person. Yeah, but just to build on from that, I'm actually, I'll turn to Russell now, but um, to build on from that, Russell, um, <clears throat> someone has suggested, has asked a question about, um, how is it possible ever to move on from the military to, to, um, to make that successful transition when he can't get memories of the deployments that he went on off his mind and the horrible sights he saw? As long as, the, um, as long as those memories come back, he can't make that transition into civilian life. And I suppose that's probably not an unreasonable point. Yeah, I think so. I think, I think they can make the transition. I think it's a long process. Um, I think too, if you if you think about military training, which usually occurs for people in early adulthood or late teens or whatever, the very developmentally, it's a you know they're forming adult personalities, and I guess we think of military training as a very powerful classical conditioning model, and so a people are um, developing an, a military personality, if you like, but also if they're traumatised or anything along the way and that's not dealt with, they're going to develop an adult personality over a few years around those symptoms of not necessarily PTSD or but however that may emerge or manifest for them. But certainly transition is possible but it's that sense of new normal I think we talk about when people go through a rehabilitation if you like that coming to terms with I'm not the soldier I was, I'm not the sergeant anymore. Yes, I've got skills and things I've learned, but I need to make a shift now. And as they, through that process of, you know, skilled therapy, be it with a psychologist, social worker or whoever, I think that does start to happen, but it does take time. My experience is, you know, six to 12, 18 months to start to get some leverage around that. But once they start to get little shifts and make small changes incrementally, they build on that with gains, with personal gains and changes. And it can happen. But I guess it does, uh, that specific question about being haunted by the memories does highlight the importance of making sure we, we engage them with effective treatment for conditions like Indeed. PTSD, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Indeed, yes. Um, if I could turn to you, while we're talking, uh, if I could turn to you, Gerard, uh, and while we're talking about, um, I guess, factors that contribute to uh, a successful or less successful transition. Um, 
how important is it, do you think, the way in which people leave the military? Uh, is it important, uh, uh, you know, I guess, if, if they've been forced to leave against their will? Well, certainly the people who are probably most distressed are people that have been separated uh, for medical reasons. And while the process is less brutal than it used to be, uh, people have to come to terms, first of all, with the fact that they may have a health condition which significantly impacts on their health. And I'm thinking simply of the physical problems that people have, and uh, certainly in the Army, uh, people with uh, continuous low back pain, uh, premature knee osteoarthritis from carrying the loads that we expect uh, infantry soldiers to carry uh, certainly feature prominently there. But uh, I chair the ADF Therapeutics Committee and you'd be surprised at how many people we have in, in the Australian Defence Force uh, who develop conditions like Crohn's disease, which uh, through no fault of the member really make them uh, undeployable uh, in a war zone because the treatments we give them uh, are not compatible uh, with being exposed to the illnesses you might encounter there. And so these alone are reasons why people uh, certainly leave. Now, people that uh, have reached compulsory retiring age may also change, but I'm, I'm just reflecting on my own experiences. I plan to retire from medicine years time. But I'm trying to work out how do I transition, how do I give myself some value, how do I reinvent myself and have a role uh, within my family and within society that's of value to others. And these are issues that uh, uh, we as doctors uh, have to confront just as the military does. Well indeed, absolutely. <clears throat> and I guess um, to a certain extent everybody does as they transition out of full-time work into retirement. I think it's, I'm very glad that you raised that because I think it's an interesting analogy. Um, but I guess in, in, in the military it's even more so. I'm wondering, um, perhaps I'll turn to you, Russell, whether just picking up on that theme there, whether you find that some people who've perhaps been um, medically discharged or, or, um, or even administratively discharged, but I suppose medically, whether there's a, a great deal of anger and resentment sometimes, feeling that they perhaps um, you know, still had more to offer, but they were kicked out. Is, is that something you would see? Yeah, and I think so. And I think it's about loss of control, Mark, because I guess one, you know, I wasn't in the military myself. My dad was. I did some reserve time years ago. But, you know, one leaves through choice or ending a career and achieves a whole mm -hmm. lot of things. But I think, um, you know, when it's out of your control and you lose control of leaving for medical reasons, and it's, as Jared says, things like Crohn's disease, which are very debilitating and you can't deploy, um, you know, they do have to transition out. And I think they just feel like I'm on the scrap heap. And whilst I know the Army just don't do it that way and Veterans Affairs just do it, don't do it that way, that's the experience of the member as they leave. And they think, you know, I had another 10 or 15 years to do yet and I had things I wanted to do and I've got mates, you know, men and women colleagues that are going back and doing it again and I wish I was there. So I think that's their sort of struggle and dilemma and brings up that anger and, and volatility, I guess. So the social inclusion and social networking that Nicole talked about and groups like Make for Mates and Soldier on and those ex this stuff and, and we saw it in the, um, in the games of recently in Sydney and um, Invictus Games, I think those sort of things are important to encourage and normalise those sorts of reactions because veterans think I'm the only one that went through this and when they link with others that have similar experiences it's that veteran camaraderie again and, and collective sense rather than yeah. I'm on my own. Yeah. I, I certainly wanted to pick up that uh, a bit later on when we talk about services or what to do about it but I think I'm glad you raised it there and I might come back to it. Um, but certainly those kinds of powerful emotions of feeling um, isolated and angry and, and so on are clearly going to make the process of transition that much more difficult, aren't they? Um, if we could, uh, before I leave this idea of, of the theme of um, the influence of, of military experiences on, on the transition process, I just want to acknowledge that the discussion about moral injury and I thought the points that Nicole made were, were very, very valid. Um, I guess I'm, I'm reluctant to go too far down that route because it is such a complex 
issue and it's so tied up with mental health and PTSD per se, and I, I want to make sure we stay on transition. Um, indeed, I, I, you know, I would suggest that maybe one of these webinars down the track deals with that issue of moral injury and the, the moral conflicts inherent in some employment. It's a fascinating area. But before I do shut down that discussion, did anybody want to make any sort of other comments about that issue of moral injury or the difficulty of how that might impact upon transition? I'm not saying you have to, but I'm just chucking it out there before I, I don't want to feel, I don't want anyone to feel I'm brushing it under the carpet. I think that's what I'm trying to say. No, nothing at the moment. You can always come back to it later. What I would like to do then is just, is just shift the discussion slightly and talk about other factors that um, may influence a, a good or a bad outcome in transition and what we ought to be aware of. And I'll perhaps ask you, Nicole, um, whether there are other groups that we should be targeting for special assistance during the process of transition. I'm going to start off with a, what seems like a simple one. Um, we tend to think, I tend to think of um, people who've done a really long military career and then, like, like um, Gerard and being a doctor, a long military career and then having to get out of it, that that's a big adjustment. But do you think the transition can also be difficult for someone who's only served a fairly short time? Uh, yes, so what we're seeing is that we get problems with transition, um, including those who have served in the military for a very short period of time. So the recent research, the Transition and Wellbeing Research Program, uh, showed us that some of the people with the most difficult issues around transition were those who we, we would call early service leaders, those who had less than four years service, those who were medically discharged, um, and those who were younger. Uh, so some of those problems were not about whether or not you deployed um, or what you had experienced during your military career, but more so what you never got to experience during your military career. Um, so for people who perhaps had particular goals or they were seeing this, that this was going to be their career for life, that that didn't occur for them. Um, and sometimes we see that these people really have problems then trying to refocus. What am I now going to do with my career? But also in terms of help seeking, it appears that maybe they don't see themselves as being the sorts of people who can access those help. They certainly don't see themselves as being veterans um, or as being someone who should be accessing services which are being offered by an ex-service organisation. Um, so they're you know, their ability to do help seeking um, can be influenced by the fact that they don't see themselves as, as being deserving or that those services are designed for them. I think it's a, that's a very important point, isn't it? And how we get that message out there that actually these services are for you. I mm -hmm. thought you just touched on a very interesting point as well, that um, the term veteran is not something that a lot of our younger servicemen and women uh, feel terribly comfortable with, is it? That's, that's correct. So legislatively, um, a veteran is anyone who served one day uh, in the full-time military. Um, sometimes people think that it's about whether or not you've deployed. Um, but many of our contemporary uh, veterans or ex-serving people wouldn't call themselves veterans at all, even though that some of them have had significant military service um, as well as a significant deployment experience. Um, so that's something to really be aware of when you're um, talking to people. Um, again, think about what What's the meaning of their service for them? What's the type of terminology that they're using? Um, and also when you're doing assessments or when you're talking to people, um, don't make presumptions about whether or not they have ever been in the military. Um, you know, what, a good example is that if I turned up to my GP, it's very unlikely that they would ask me whether or not I'd spent the last 23 years in the full-time military. Um, and again, so you know, ma making sure that you're, you're not making presumptions um, about someone and uh, what their military service may have been and what it may have meant for them and how long they may have been in that military service for. Yeah, that's a, a very interesting point you raised towards the end there, uh, Nicole. I know there's a, uh, a big program going on in the States at the moment trying to encourage health providers to just ask that question, mm. have you ever served in the military? Such a simple question. And if the answer to that is yes, well, that opens a whole new pathway of care, potentially. That's, important. that's right. Um, let's just expand it out, and if I can bring in um, Gerard and Russell, and look, I ex accept the fact that this might be just anecdotal, but I'm interested in whether there are any other um, groups that we might identify as being more or less at risk. And let me chuck it out there um, to begin with. What about men? Do you think that men are more at risk than women? Do they have greater difficulties with this um, change of identity than women? 
don't want to get controversial there, but I just thought I'd check it out. Well, I, I, I think men actually do have more difficulties because uh, it's very much like men retiring from paid employment. Uh, so much of your personal self-worth is tied up in your job and all of the socialization that occurs in work that is lost when you leave uh, a working environment. And the military is really good at socialization and that sense of belonging to a team something uh, that's really hard to capture uh, in a lot of contemporary civilian employment. Yeah. yeah. Look, I think okay. men and women men and women access services quite differently and you know, be it military background or not. And I think that has to be borne in mind. And for example, I know in the broader population, not just the veteran population, with a lot of the suicide prevention stuff and are you okay day and all that kind of thing, tends to target women more and the men's suicide rate is much higher. Now, what happens post-military with suicide rate comparing genders, I'm not so sure. but I think we have to think about how we access services. And I've had feedback from female veterans that they went through a lot of services tailored to veterans, not the CDCF or open arms, and felt, felt it was very male oriented. And you know, I think there, I know there's there's female veterans groups on Facebook and social media and all sorts of stuff. But I think we need to bring in that sense of differentness about how services are accessed. Whether you might see it differently, Nicole, I'd be interested in your view. No, I agree with you, Russell. Um, that is one of the comments that we get from females, um, that they might be better at seeking support, um, and we, we know that they are better than males are at uh, reaching out and asking for support. But whether or not the services are there that are suitable for them, they often will talk about um, going to ex-service organisations and sometimes feeling that the services are not designed for them, that they don't feel welcome. I think that we've really seen a change in that over the last few years and there have been a, a big effort to um, make sure that services are applicable for women, for younger veterans, for contemporary veterans. Um, but anecdotally, um, women have spoken about the fact that some of those services they've not felt as welcome as they, they had hoped for when they, they reached out for support. Absolutely. So, so we talk a lot about accessibility of services, but mm. it's also acceptability of services. If they're not acceptable, there's no point in having them. Okay, there, there's great. Also, there's, sorry, just quickly, there's also a sense of topping it out on your own. I think men do that a bit more, but the military conditions about that. Work it out for yourself. Don't go and get help work it out and tough it out. And I think that that's a big part of that transitional culture and identity that probably needs to be addressed first. Absolutely. I'm sure it's true in, in society generally and even yeah. worse, I, I'm sure, in um, in the military. So let's, um, if I could move it along, um, I guess what, what the outcome of that discussion is that there may be some high-risk groups and I'm wondering whether we should be targeting them at the point of transition and giving them extra support and resources you know, before they leave the military. Um, can I ask you, Nicole, um, does Defence actually provide anything to members before they transition out? Uh, so there are a great deal of services and support which are currently being provided by Defence and by Veterans Affairs. So there is a joint program and a task force which has been put together over recent years in terms of making the transition uh, process uh, smoother but also more comprehensive um, and certainly members are being encouraged uh, to start thinking about their transition um, years out from the time that they do it to be going to transition seminars to be thinking about vocational changes um, and those services are starting to be available not just at the point of transition but thinking about how do you follow up people um, in the months uh, following that transition. Um, having transitioned myself not that long ago, um, uh, I was certainly followed up for the months afterwards. Um, I had uh, a check-in survey every few months, how I was going, whether or not um, I had any particular service needs. Um, and I know that that is a process which is becoming more and more sophisticated over time. Um, we're starting to think about transition as not just being that period of time when you actually get out of your uniform. The transition is a process that occurs in the months and even the years after people um, take off the uniform and start to reintegrate into civilian life. 
uh, and the services are thinking about how do you how do you support people over time? Um, and we know that sometimes it can take months or years before those problems start to emerge. Um, there may be money in the bank when people first get out. They might have a job lined up. They might be really excited about leaving, but then they might become quite disillusioned by that. They start to um, miss their military life, their military mates. The, the grass isn't quite as green on the other side as they thought that it might be, um, and that those problems can in fact start to escalate for them um, the further that they get away from the time that they were serving in, in uniform. And the services are starting to take that into consideration. Yeah, good, good, good. So a recognition that transition is a long process. That's, that's yeah. clearly, clearly important. Um, I wonder, Gerard, what you think about that idea of this kind of assertive outreach of, of um, the military following up people after they've left. Do you think that would go down well with all ex-service personnel or would some resent it, do you think? I think certain people uh, have had unhappy experiences with the military and have left uh, because of those unhappy experiences. and. You know, it's a hierarchical system. Uh, you may have been told uh, that your career uh, rank is this particular level and uh, that limits your opportunities to do some exciting things. Other people may have had the disappointments of not doing the thing that the military is really about, which is fighting a war. And uh, I, I was hoping we would have an epidemic of peace. But that doesn't seem to be a feature of our life, and it certainly hasn't been over the last 25 years uh, in the Australian Defence Force. Uh, and all of these things, I think, impact on uh, how people sort of feel uh, about leaving. And the, the other sort of thing is that uh, people find the bureaucracy, which has to underlie these systems to ensure a degree of fairness, some of them find it really difficult and hard to sort of deal with. And people want an answer now rather than uh, having to wait to work your way through, particularly in some of the medical claims for physical injuries, having to work your way through a whole series of evidence-based uh, approaches as to whether defence has a liability for you or not. So yeah. they compound some of the issues. Yeah, and, and of course the DVA claims process has come in for a lot of criticism, some of it justified I think, some of it less so, um, because of exactly the stuff you're talking about. I do, it's my impression that things are getting better all the time. I don't know whether you can comment on it, Russell, but um, that there are now more um, properly, well, well-trained case managers or whatever to, to sort of handhold the veteran through the process. Is that your understanding? Yeah, I think so. And from what I stand, what do I understand with the ex-service group welfare officers, the accreditation process now is a lot more complex. The Act of Parliament and where people, depending on their services, where they might get various entitlements from, is pretty complex. Um, I think the intentions are better than it was. I think there's, there's attempts to make it less bureaucratic, but sometimes people just bump up against something and they they look around them and say, look. I did all this stuff on my deployment or my deployments, and I see these other people who didn't do much at all who seem to walk through the door. Why has that happened? Why it's, and they always see those sort of inequities. So I think um, it's certainly better. It's, I think it's, it is better, but you'll always get those anomalies and you'll always get people who are disgruntled. And that's where I think seeing groups emerge like Mates for Mates, like Soldier On, like Young Diggers that can keep in touch or let them know they're around in a non-bureaucratic way so veterans don't feel like they're hounded or ex-service people don't feel they're hounded by the bureaucracy. I think that's kind of a friendly way and a more uh, positive lifestyle way to encourage people to engage in all sorts of ways post-service. Yeah, so um, you mentioned earlier, and I, I do think it's so important, um, and, and I guess you would as well, Gerard, you talked about the sense of um, uh, belonging and so on that comes in the military and, and, and presumably once they become a veteran, if they can link in with these groups, the ones that um, Russell was mentioning, like um, Soldier On and, and so on, that that help, do you, would you see that as helpful in the process of making that transition? It certainly is, but again, like all human organisations, uh, these depend on the personalities of the people in it and uh, there are certain personalities in all organisations uh, that 
rub people up the wrong way. And if they are particularly at the top, there are things there. And we've had a history uh, in the RSL of whatever war you fought in, uh, if you came afterwards, your war was never as good as ours. <laughs> and that's been a uh, problem uh, that, that's there. And I think it applies in, in a number of other organisations. But the, the organise, you know, the, the, you know, the organisations that are now developing, I think, are offering a range of alternatives. And no longer is it just the RSL that's in this playing space. There, there are a number of organisations. But particularly for veterans in rural and regional areas, uh, the choices are less there. And while DVA has a number of resources which people can access online or through web apps, uh, they probably don't make up for that sort of sense of belonging and having someone to sort of share and help you through. And one of the most poignant things I ever heard about the RSL is we're about looking after our mates so that nobody is a loner. I think it's a, it's a very good uh, it's a very good line, isn't it? And I, I think your point about rural and remote veterans, it's true for mental health generally, but it's I'm going to have to move Mark, people can along. Can I just add? Yeah, <laughs> can I? sure, sure, sure. Yeah, go. Sorry, just, just a couple of things. Um, <laughs> first of all, with uh, DVA claims, um, there has been a lot of work in terms of streamlining those, and particularly for common conditions. Um, but it is complex. Uh, so the, there is an important role for advocates and the ESOs in terms of helping people, especially those who are in the midst of a uh, mental disorder um, or a life crisis. Sometimes they need assistance with those. Um, I think it's also important that we have support and information for families and friends because they're often the ones that encourage and help people to get assistance as well. Um, and whilst the ESOs, uh, ex-service organisations have an important role, we also know that it's really important that people are reintegrating and making connections with just the community, not just with um, ex-military, um, but also more broadly in the community. And that's what we should be encouraging uh, people to be doing as they're moving out of their military careers. Yeah, I think it's an excellent point, isn't it? So the, um, the veterans groups can be very, very helpful, but not just those. It's that your whole life is not defined by being a veteran, hopefully. Correct. Um, We've got to move on. I just want to say this very quickly, so if anyone's got any quick comments, please do. I'm interested in how important uh, employment is. Someone mentioned, a couple of people mentioned vocational training and so on. And it seems to me that helping veterans to find meaningful employment, something that, that you know they can spend their time doing meaningfully, uh, and occupational rehab and so on, new career, is crucial to mental health and crucial to adjustment. Is that, would people go along with that? Any, they have to be very, very quick. Very quick comments on that. Okay. It, it is yeah. crucial, and particularly because a lot of the people who are leaving the military are young. Um, the average age of service is about seven to ten years, so they have a lot of working life ahead of them, and so reconnecting them in or giving them a second career is very important. Okay, good. I'm sorry that we had to do that one quickly, because I think it is actually crucial. But you also mentioned families, and I do want to touch on families quickly. It was one of our themes there. Um, and, and I guess um, I might turn to you, Russell, actually, about... Um, I guess anything that you've got to say about, about um, how we can help families, both in terms of helping families themselves, but also helping families to help their veteran loved ones. I guess both of those are important when we're thinking about family. Absolutely. And, you know, even if families are estranged and, you know, hopefully they can come together in a safe space to explore some of this stuff. But I know when I was at VVCS now, Open Arms, they, used to, they started doing family consultations and I think not necessarily family therapy but where you could bring family members into the same room, the ex-member or the veteran has a sense of his mental health issues and transitional issues and he can discuss them. So they know that if he's isolating himself, do we worry about it, do we do something? If he's hyper aroused or it's a particular time of the year that's troubling because of what may have happened in their deployment, how do we deal with that? And if, if, if everyone can understand what's helpful or the veteran can say, it helps me if you come and see how I am or I just want to be left alone. And they want to say, we want to know you're safe and you're not going to do anything silly. So I think it's all those assurances and bringing family in, like whether they're an intact family or not. And if they're not, hopefully it's a safe enough space where they can start to have those conversations and 
co-parent in a positive way and all that kind of stuff, which was such an issue coming back to Garth because he was wanting to co-parent and he left the military and set himself up in a little flat just so he could do that. And no, it didn't work out, but hopefully down the track, you know, those sorts of things might happen. So they really are crucial because it's a systemic issue and the family carries it too. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, anything from a defence perspective, Nicole, that you would say about family? Uh, so uh, families are encouraged to come in as part of the transition process. Uh, and there's a lot of information which is provided. It's also done through Open Arms um, and through the ex-service organisations. I think that we've seen a lot of work being done over recent years in terms of engaging with families and trying to provide them with um, information, but also with um, support services as well. Time, I'm afraid, is running on. It always goes so incredibly fast. Uh, I, I guess I'm, the comment that I'm left with or struck by is it always strikes me that we spend so much time and resources and energy training people to be soldiers or other military serving personnel, and we train, we give them almost no training at all in, in how to be a civilian again. So maybe we need to rebalance it there. But I guess, and, and you may have any uh, final comments on this, but I suppose in an ideal world, we're really looking at a kind of holistic approach to helping the veteran transition with involvement from uh, not only their family and the member, but also medical and health and occupational rehab professionals and, and so on. That kind of um, holistic approach is probably going to be the way to go, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, look, as I say, unfortunately, time has run out on us, as it always does. Um, but I would like to see if we can finish on a, um, well, on a kind of positive note. The reality is that a lot of people do transition out of the military into civilian life very successfully. They do well. Nicole is there as a wonderful example of how this can be done. So um, I guess I'd like, you know, I, I was going to ask you just for your final take-home comments, uh, which I will do. Um, but I just wonder if, if you've got any final take-home comments about kind of top tips for a successful transition or what you think is important in transitioning, transitioning successfully. Um, so just literally a, a few points, but um, Gerard? Well, I, I think the thing is that uh, life goes on, and there is life after the military, uh, and uh, uh, many people uh, have uh, had great uh, contributions to society after they left the military, uh, and that's something that we need to keep in mind. And uh, it, you know, we basically moved a million people from our World War II defence forces into civilian life, and they built modern Australia. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think that that um, yeah, that note of optimism and and engendering that optimism in people as they're coming out of the military, I think is crucial. Thank you very much, Gerard. Uh, Russell, your yeah, look, successful transition. Yeah, look, I think for certainly for the for the member to engage properly with the service and for councillors and people that are watching this, to really engage well and build up that trust and set the boundaries properly. And if that's done well, the the process that someone like Garth might go through, even though it might take some months or maybe a year or so, happens better. And if an old a GP we used to work with in WA used to say the veterans that had a lot of bad days, you know, everything was a bad day. After a while, they would say, the good days get better, they're longer, there's more of them, you string more together. You have a bad day, and when you do, you let yourself have it. You lie low, and it passes, and you understand that. So I think it's that existential thing, Mark. I think that finding meaning at the end of the day and making sense of why the transition happened, how it did, and why things weren't all that wonderful when they leave the military, when they thought they'd have a great civilian life. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, at that, that point about being able to deal with the bad days when they happen and shrug your shoulders at the bad days, I think is really important. Uh, thank you, Russell. Uh, Nicole, your tips for a successful transition. Yeah, so most people transition out of the military and be able to talk about professional and personal rewards that they um, have gained and skills and strengths that they've gotten out of their military service. Um, but a 
successful transition is a planned transition um, and it does realise that there will be some challenges regardless of the type of transition. Um, most people will do well but there will be some that will struggle um, and as practitioners some of you may come across people who are complex and you find that you, uh, you really are having difficulty with them either because of the type of problems that they're having or because of their military service. Um, I'd just like to highlight that DBA funds Phoenix Australia to provide a free service to practitioners to provide support. You can see the details for that um, on the information under the uh, Phoenix Australia website. But that idea that you can call up or access the website and get um, clinical consultations from a multidisciplinary team to assist you to deal with um, veterans and the types of mental disorders that they might have. So even if you're remote um, or don't do a lot of work with veterans, there's a free service that you can access to get support. Thank you, Nicole. And that is a great service, it seems to me, <laughs> that, that anybody can get on there and talk to a psychiatrist or an experienced uh, mental health provider and, and get this advice. So I think it's a great thing. Thank you for that, Nicole. Um, I'm just going to very quickly uh, finish off with some, some um, information kind of stuff. This first slide is showing you that um, MHPN supports um, local networks where providers, multidisciplinary teams can meet together, support each other, share resources, and they um, have specific veteran-focused ones as well. So uh, they're, they're located in those areas you can see on the screen. Um, there's more information uh, in the resources tab, but if you're interested in starting your own in your area, get in touch with MHPN. Talking of resources, um, we will be sending you the link to the resources. There's a whole lot of good stuff there, picking up on some of the services that we talked about tonight um, and a whole range of other things. Uh, I would particularly recommend the DVA At Ease website, which I think is really good for providers, for um, veterans, for families, and so on. Lots of good stuff there. But a whole range of other resources will be there on the, uh, on, on the resources. Can I just ask you please to um, complete the feedback survey before you log out? Your feedback is really uh, very important to us. And uh, as we say, you'll receive an email link uh, in the next uh, few days or weeks. But for now, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much to our panelists, uh, Gerard, Russell, and Nicole, who I thought did a magnificent job tonight. I thought it was a great webinar. And thank you very much to all of you, to our participants uh, all across the country tonight for joining us and for participating and engaging so well in the webinar. It really makes it much more fun and enjoyable for us. So thank you to everyone and good night to all. Good night.